Okay, so we're all on to our second part of Unit 6, or the gravity circular motion in the satellite. So this is now the circular motion in satellites portion in Chapter 10. So we're going to look at the circular motion kind of piece, how we get into circular satellite orbits, elliptical orbits, Kepler's law. Um, might talk a little bit about energy and escape speed uh, a bit as we go. So circular motion um, is this idea of motion in a circle at constant speed and constant radius. Okay, So our velocity is going to be tangent to the circle, and the object is going to be held in a circle by an inward-seeking centripetal force. So where this is coming from is if we go back to Newton's first law. So Newton's first law had told us that objects like to stay in motion in a straight line at constant speed unless acted on by an outside force. Up until now, the forces that we've been dealing with were always changing the speed. Now the force that we're going to be dealing with, the centripetal force, is going to be changing the direction. So to understand what's going on here, we need to be able to talk about some terms. So first is circumference. And that's going to be the path traveled around the circle for us. So circumference is pi, uh, 2 pi r. You know. Radius is just the radius of the circle. And then two new terms you may have never heard of before, frequency and period. Depending on your math, you might have heard of before. But frequency is the revolutions per time or the cycles per time. And period is the time per revolution or the time per cycle. So frequencies are in RPM or revs per second. Periods are in just seconds. Um, and then we're dealing with velocity. So we're talking about the tangential speed or that velocity around the circle. So up until now, all our velocities were always distance over time. Well, now our distance has become the circumference. Our time, well, that's now the time per revolution. So we could either be, again, 2 pi r over period or the 2 pi rf, because if we don't want to do the time per revolution, we can do the revolutions per time, which is the frequency, okay? And that's how we get these two different definitions for velocity. I will say that this particular one, the one that's 2 pi r over period, is the most common one for us to deal with uh, in this unit. So, as we're kind of going around that circle, we know that if a velocity is changing, whether it's speed or direction, there has to be an acceleration because that force will cause an acceleration. So we can go, go through the math, go through all the motions of it, and we find that that acceleration radial is equal to V squared over R. Okay, So radial acceleration or centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. So we know that there has to be a force. Well, the question is what's causing that force? What's causing that centripetal force? Well, it could be different things. It could be, in this case, the string that's pulling on the ball. If it's a car going around the curve, it could be the friction between the tires and the road. If it's a planet going around a star, it's the force of gravity. So different forces cause this centripetal force, this F sub R, all right? Which we know any force is a mass times an acceleration, so mass and acceleration radio. So in our case, it's going to be the mass that's going in the circle times v squared over r. That will tell us our acceleration radial, which will give us our force centripetal. So again, just to kind of recap here, our acceleration radial is v squared over r. Our force radial is mass acceleration radial or mass v squared over r. Okay. So that gives us our centripetal acceleration and our centripetal force. But again, that centripetal force has to be caused by something has to be caused by a tension in a string, friction with the road, gravity. Um, there has to be something that causes that force. It just doesn't happen on its own. Now, just to kind of clear up some nomenclature stuff, centripetal is what we're talking about here, which is center-seeking. You may have heard the term centrifugal before, okay? Probably because of this little device you use in chemistry or biology called a centrifuge. Centrifugal force doesn't really exist. It's kind of a... a an aspect that you're experiencing because of Newton's third law and first law. So Newton's third law tells you forces come in pairs. So if there has to be a force on the object like the ball and you're swinging the ball, well, you're going to feel an outward tug because you're the one that's providing the inward pull on the ball. So that's why you think there's something outward because you're pulling on it. Uh, and then inertia 
is what makes things want to keep going in the straight line. So that's why things appear to want to go outward because you're trying to force it into the straight line, uh, out of the straight line and into the circle. So that's why you think it wants to go outward. That's why it's pulling on you outward. It's because you're pulling to force it to go in the circle because Newton's first law says it wants to go in a straight line. But you're forcing against inertia to say, no, go in the curve. So again, there is no centrifugal force, okay? Because if you look at this little diagram here, it doesn't just fly off outward. If it does break off, it goes tangent to the circle, all right? It's not going to go wee outward. It's going to stay tangent to the circle. All right, so this brings us to circular orbits. So the curvature of the Earth, uh, you know, though some of you may believe it's flat, is actually curved. We are a spherical planet. Um, is roughly a five meter drop, so five meter vertical drop, for every 8,000 meters tangent to the surface that we go. So every eight kilometers horizontal that we go. So if I was able to create a projectile that if I shot it fast enough so that it would go eight kilometers before it fell five meters, it would actually start orbiting the Earth. And this is actually something that Newton started to theorize on his own. He thought that if you could toss something or launch something fast enough, you could actually hit yourself in the back of the head. You know, fire a gun or a cannon fast enough, you could actually hit yourself in the back of the head with it. And this is how we started to think about satellites in circular orbit. So if the speed was great enough to ensure that the falling distance matched the curvature of the Earth, you'd actually get a satellite. Because you've got to realize that we're moving with a constant velocity, only the direction is changing, and gravity, he was assuming, was going to be unchanged. So now, into the real world. Well, we need to position our satellites beyond Earth's atmosphere, okay, where the air resistance is almost totally absent. So we need to take and put our space shuttles, our, our, our other equipment, way out at least about 150 kilometers above Earth, okay? So, in theory, the distance we're at is the radius of Earth plus 150 kilometers, okay? Or more. Um, when we start talking about geostationary satellites, they're 35,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. For the period of that orbit, so a space shuttle, the International Space Station, most telecommunication satellites, it takes about 90 minutes for it to go around the Earth once, okay? The further away that the satellite is, the longer the period is, okay? So when you get the idea of a geostationary satellite, the period has to be exactly 24 hours because we want it to stay exactly in place around a certain point on Earth, okay? So when you toss a projectile sideways, it curves as it falls. It will be an Earth satellite if the curve it makes does what? Matches the curve of the surface of Earth, results in a straight line, spirals out indefinitely, or none of the above. Correct answer is A, if it matches the curvature, curvature of the surface of the Earth. When a satellite travels at a constant speed, the shape of its path will be a circle, an ellipse, an oval that is almost elliptical, a circle with a square corner as seen through your book. Correct answer is a circle. So if we get perfectly constant speed, we get that perfectly uniform circular motion. However, welcome to the real world. In the real world, we get elliptical orbits. And that's because we're not going to get that perfect speed. We're going to get this, this system, system where we have to have an ellipse because there's one focus where it appears to orbit around and then another focus you know, of that elliptical shape. Um, just remember, a circle is an ellipse. It's just that special case of an ellipse where the two foci collapse in on themselves. So even our planets are not in circular motion. Okay? Our planets have slightly elliptical orbits. Okay? They're very close to circles, but they're still slightly elliptical. So here's what happens. So the speed of the satellite is going to vary a bit. So when it's close to the Earth, we'll say, it's going faster, and it kind of overshoots, and it goes up higher. So it comes up here, it goes up higher. And it makes it up and around, slows down, slows down, slows down, and then comes back. All right? And then that process just repeats itself and repeats itself. So it's going faster, slower, comes back, faster, slower, comes back, faster, slower, comes back. And that's how the satellite orbits. Now, a lot of them aren't as exaggerated as the, these images. They, they just got a slight wobble to them, but some could have these exaggerated orbits if they're 
coming in very close and then going far away, coming in close, going far away. So the speed of a satellite in an elliptical orbit will vary, remain constant, act at right angles to the motion, or all of the above. And it's going to vary. So the first person to really analyze this fact about real planetary data was Johannes Kepler. All right. Now, he didn't take the data himself. Uh, another astronomer by the name of Tycho Brahe had taken the data, and Kepler was actually hired by Brahe to analyze the data. Then this really odd thing kind of happens. You know, Brahe dies, and then T uh, Kepler's left with the data. We don't know if he stole it, acquired it through the, the death. We just still don't know how Brahe truly died. You know, was it Kepler have something to do with it? Was it his family? You know, Brahe's family had something to do with it. Um, but Kepler's able to finish the analysis of the data, and he's able to figure out that, first, first of all, that planets are not circular in their path. They're or they orbit in elliptical paths. And then he used his op these observations to formulate three laws about planetary motion. So the first of these laws was kind of the obvious one, that each planet goes around the sun in an ellipse, and the sun is one of the focuses. So here's one of the foci right here. It'd be like an imaginary focus up here, too, that is, you know, opposite wherever it would have to be. But the sun is the main focus of the, the orbit. Uh, his second law had to deal with the areas that are swept out in equal amounts of time. So let's say that one month passes here, one month passes here. This area and this area swept out are the same area. So even though the arc covered of the ellipse is smaller from A to B than it is from C to D, or D to C, however you want to view it, um, those areas are the same. Because in one case, it's closer to the sun. In one case, it's further away from the sun. Okay? So those are kind of his, what we'll call, geometrical observations. The next was the actual pure observation out of the data. So he looked at the data, saw that he had the periods, and he saw that he had the semi-major axes of those ellipses. And the semi-major axes is basically from like the center to the longest side of an ellipse. So like from here to here, okay, of the ellipse. Now using that semi-major axes data, along with the periods, he found out that there was a relationship that the period squared was approximately equal to the semi-major axis cubed. Well, that would tell us then that Basically, t squared over a cubed would then have to equal a constant number. Right? If you have the same number, same number over same number should give us roughly 1, right? Well, let's take a look at this. Give it a little bit bigger of a view. Here's what we found out. Let's take first off Earth. So Earth, we got right here, and we're measuring our periods in years, and we're measuring our semi-major axis in something called astronomical units. Astronomical units is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So it makes sense, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, we're going to define it as 1. So if I had 1 squared, 1 cubed, I get 1 and 1, so 1 and 1. But now if I go down here to say, I don't know, Jupiter. Here's Jupiter's values. So I have 11.86 years and 5.2 astronomical units for the semi-major axis. So I get about 140.7 for the p squared and 140.6 for the a cubed. So they're basically the same value, right? Not exact, but basically. So if I did the ratios, those ratios kind of come out the same. And that was his kind of big aha moment, was figuring this out. And that meant you could now compare the orbits of different planets around the same star. So our last kind of big piece is escape velocity. So sometimes with those elliptical paths, they become too elliptical. And they actually stop being an ellipse, and you get more of a parabola. And you lose your projectile, or you lose your satellite, and they launch off. And that's because you gain enough energy and kinetic energy so that the object escapes. So we think of the object being near the planet as being stuck like in a well. And if you imagine having to get out of a well, you'd have to have a certain amount of kinetic energy to jump out of that well. And that's what we, we basically calculate to calculate escape velocities. 
So Pioneer 10, back in 1972, was the first probe that was able to escape our solar system. We've had others that around that same time, the 70s, that did escape later on, but Pioneer was the first that launched fast enough to get right out of our solar system. 